Thank you, Eloise, and uh, hi to everybody um, has been introduced. My name is Nicola Firth, and I'm the founder and CEO of Knowledge Bank. And I just wanted to talk to you today uh, about the, the changing landscape of the self-employed uh, market, because of course, what's just happened and what we've just been through in terms of the pandemic, we have seen uh, such a shift change, uh, probably the, the biggest since, since the credit crunch, really, in, in those terms. So I just wanted to start with a snapshot uh, of the market as it stands today. So just looking at the trends and, and where they've gone. So you can see here we, we are going right back to 1975, but actually I think that's really, really quite relevant. So there are 4.19 million people in the UK who are self-employed as of January 2022. So that's a massive amount of, of the workforce. Um, and there are currently, and this is something that, that I'm going to talk more about later on, but there are currently more than 500,000 workers operating through umbrella companies in the UK, and that's growing. Um, of course, you know, the, the impact of IR35. But just looking at the, the, this trend and how this has gone, so, so this stopped here then, um, you know, 2020, but in 1975, 8% of workers were self-employed and by 2019 this had increased to more than 14% and actually you can see the jump of when this started so you know a lot of uh, you know around the 90s there, there was that, that jump there and of course then if you look at that steady increase that we've had and um, since the credit crunch lots of people are perhaps uh, losing their jobs and deciding to go self-employed. Uh, and of course, you know, if you look now, careers advisors never used to talk about people going self-employed or being entrepreneurs. And, and this is something that's extremely prevalent uh, today. So let's look at the figures. So the total solo self-employed population, it has shrunk by 5%, and this is for the second year running. So, so where we stand now, we've had to decrease, but of course we know the reasons why. So just to clarify, by solo self-employed, we're talking about those individuals who work for themselves um, and not their businesses or their employees. So, so, so the main people that we're the, the dealing with here. But the solo self-employed market is huge and it contributes 303 billion pounds into the to the UK economy. Um, I think following another year of the, the uncertainty that's been brought about by uh, COVID-19 and the lockdown restrictions that we had, um, you can understand why that, that would have fallen. Of course, that was a, a big impact, um, you know, that the, the government did try and provide some help, but, you know, there was widespread criticism that what didn't go far enough for the self-employed um, and their companies. Um, but despite that, you know, massive contribution to the uh, to the UK uh, economy. And also, I'm going to talk about this in more detail as well. Freelancers. So, so we talk about freelancers, but but we will probably know them in our industry as contact contractors, and they play a critical role in the economy by enabling businesses to manage uh, and reduce the, the risk by employing professionals. Um, and they're estimated to uh, provide approximately 147 billion of that 303 billion. Uh, into the economy. So that's really quite significant. So let's have a little look then at the skill profiles of the people that we're talking about uh, with regards to uh, self-employed. So what you see on here, so the SOC, this is the Standard Occupational Classification, which is an internationally recognised system that classifies occupations according to the skill level uh, required for them. So there are currently nine levels of uh, SOC codes. And they range from managers and directors and senior officials at the top there, uh, and at the top end, and they go down to the elementary occupations at SOC 9. And they would be something that generally require minimum level of education or maybe just a little bit of training to do that job. So looking at specific occupations, the number of people working in the biggest solo self-employment occupational group are construction and the trades. Uh, so that's perhaps what you, you might expect. You can see there at 25%. Um, but they have dropped uh, by 10% to 366,000. Um, the, the SOC 5 category includes skilled trades occupations ranging from the construction uh, to agricultural as well. So, so it does include those and also food preparation. So, so we would think naturally construction, but of course it, it does include the others there as well. So this group accounts for 25% so of the total self-employed population, and that's remained the same uh, in 20 and 21. So, so percentage-wise, they've, they've remained the same as accounting for a quarter of all of those. 
The third biggest group um, is artistic, literary and media occupations. Uh, that's also decreased with numbers falling uh, by 14%. Uh, now, this is interesting because, of course, social media would come on in that. And we've seen a lot of people and younger people as well uh, getting into that and actually making a living uh, by being influencers and having their YouTube channels uh, and other things. So on the other hand, uh, road transport drivers and agricultural uh, related trades, they rose by 6%. Uh, so that's perhaps not surprising. Of course, we, we know what went off with the HGV drivers and everything that happened there. So interestingly, SOC 7, sales and customer service occupations, that's historically been the smallest group. Um, this has increased by 108% since 2020. Um, and this is representing by far the biggest increase in one go. So that's a really interesting one to watch. Not relevant to mortgage lending, uh, but just to know out of interest whilst we're looking at the figures, there was a small swing in favour of the number of women who are now self-employed. And this increased by 1% from 2019 to 2020. So that's just quite interesting. Still, um, you know, very much... Um, weighted towards men that are self-employed uh, but you can see that gap is narrowing so let's have a look at age because this is relevant to mortgage lending now the average age of the uk's uh solo self-employed person remains the same uh, as it was in 2019 and 2020 and that is the average age being 47 years old so the largest age groups in 2021 were 50 to 59 uh, year olds um, and they were just over a million. And then the 40 to 49 year olds were just, just under a million. But when you put those two together, uh, those two groups actually account for almost half of the whole solo employed population. So that's quite significant because when we're talking about people who are aged between 40 and 59, you've got to start then thinking about the mortgage term. So this is really quite, uh, quite relevant. I suppose that if you look that there's um, all the age groups that are sort of decreasing uh, in size, um, but of course that's reflective of what's happening in the job market. So I said we'd be talking about freelancers a little bit more. So I just wanted to cover uh, this sector off because this is, um, you know, we know freelancers as contractors. So, um, so they're a subsection of the self-employed and they currently make up 46% of the uh, self-employed population. So these are people um, who are working for periods of time for maybe one company uh, or maybe, maybe a couple of companies. And of course, we've seen massive changes there in respect of IR35. Um, in fact, over a third of contractors, um, so 35% to be exact, uh, have left freelance work since the uh, reforms uh, with regards to that. So that's quite significant. And I think we've seen that in the industry. But as you see here, that the top five occupations account for almost 50% of, of all of the freelancers. Um, you know, we have the, you know, obviously teaching professionals, um, you know, those who are, um, you know, taking contracts for perhaps management and consultancy services. Could also be sports and fitness occupations, um, like, for example, personal trainers uh, or, or gym instructors and classes. So, so they do make up quite a, a large, uh, significant part of the uh, self-employed market so let's have a look how that translates across the country so this is quite interesting so this is uh, so this is the increase and decrease in self-employed people across the uk since 2020 now as we see greater london stands out we always we always have a look at london because that kind of has its own little uh, environment going on uh, there in in london and the greater london area and of course we did see a lot of people moving out of that area and there's a drop there of 16 percent but interestingly as you look uh, further north there are areas that have really increased so for example um we've got northern ireland Yorkshire and the Humber, uh, so just edging into the northeast there, and also Wales as well. So Wales there with, with a 40% increase, so that's quite um, quite significant. And there are interesting trends that, that sit behind that. There's a common statistic uh, that does the rounds that one in five new businesses fail in the first five years. So you might be surprised to hear the length of time that the uh, UK solo self-employed workforce have been self-employed shows that 41% have been working this way for over 10 years. That's really good because that should give us some confidence. Uh, and you know, you've seen these clients who they've had their own business for quite a few years and it's, you know, 
it, it generally ticks along quite nicely. And so similarly, 20% of the solo self-employed workforce began self-employment between 2014 and 2017, whilst a further 9% became self-employed between 2011 and 2013. So that's quite interesting. Um, and, and it's actually only another 13% that have been in self-employment since 2020. One other quite interesting fact as well, um, for those aged 65 and over, the, the employment rate increased um, in 2020 to 10.4%. So again, if you're looking at the uh, longevity of businesses, that's quite a, quite a promising outlook, to be fair. So let's have a look. How does that look in terms of mortgages? And what have we seen? How is that translated? And of course, from 2020 onwards, how, how does that look? Well, one of the main things that we've seen are LTV restrictions for self-employed. Um, and that has been across the board. And actually, you know, in, in some circumstances, that's, that's remained regardless of whether their business has been affected by the pandemic. And um, of course, you know, we think quite about businesses that have been affected negatively. And of course, some businesses, let's not forget, have had massive positive uh, implications uh, as they've maybe pivoted or just been able to, um, to go off the success um, of, of everything that's happened and, and really capitalise on that. So, so LTV restrictions across the board, we have seen that and, and that's very difficult for lenders to, to try and say, um, you know, how they'll change that and who for. One of the other things that I know you'll have seen is the, the request for extra documentation. And I think this is only natural. Obviously, lenders need that comfort in being able to underwrite. And so extra document, documentation really is quite vital. Um, the assessment of accounts. You know, how are they assessing the accounts? Because 2020 was a massive blip in everybody's accounts. You know, the, the businesses were fine, but they were, you know, that they were forced to close down, otherwise they would have continued. And of course, for some businesses, that, that was the death knell. They weren't able to recover from that. But then you get other businesses, you know, like hairdressers, for example, people were desperate. They couldn't wait to get back as soon as hairdressers opened again. So, you know, they they were busier than they'd ever been. So, so how are we assessing? in those accounts obviously lots of additional questions and again i think that's fair of lenders to be asking those uh, additional questions uh, around the businesses and, and the um, how the businesses have, have operated and survived also we're seeing different treatment of the seas schemes and and how lenders are looking at that and we have seen a 30 to 40 percent increase um, in searches on knowledge bank for the categories around the self-employed um, and those around the specifically the COVID categories around self-employed as well. So what tips can I give you for uh, mortgages for the self-employed? Well, the first one I would absolutely give you is the assessment of accounts and I've just referred to it there. So when we are looking at assessment accounts, I'm just showing you here on Knowledge Bank, we have got a category for it. Lots of lenders didn't know at first, understandably, how they were going to assess those accounts, because of course, if they're taking an average of so many years, there is this blip in 2020 that is absolutely unavoidable and will be on just about everybody's accounts. So, so if you go into there, the assessment of accounts affordability, you'll be able to see exactly what each lender is saying. How are they doing that? Are they taking the latest year? Are they taking an average? Are they taking a projection? So that's going to be absolutely vital when you're trying to work out affordability is how they are going to assess those accounts. The other thing I would say is dig deep and question further. Um, this, is a, this is a big thing and I know you'll be used to doing this anyway. But there are things that you can find out when you have that conversation with uh, your client that you might actually be able to do something and perhaps pivot that application in a different direction. So, for example, with regards to an accountant's projection, you know, if you check uh, and we got the category for that, who, who will accept an accountant's projection? Because some lenders will consider that if there's a good story there um, or if there's reason to be optimistic uh, or be realistic, but optimistic as well uh, about that business. So it's definitely worth looking at and asking that question if they've maybe hit a bump, um, but it's, it, there's a really good explanation behind it and, and that they can recover from that and are doing the other thing then is the net profit in, in the limited company. This is a really, really good one. Sometimes it's just not relevant or, or preferable to be taking salary and dividends. And there are lenders 
that will do that, absolutely. Uh, and of course, Kensington being one of them. Um, and, but that's a great piece of criteria that, that you can look at now. Your clients probably not thinking about that. They're just going to tell you, look, this is what I earn. Um, but if you can just dig a little bit deeper and question that a little bit further, they might be pleasantly surprised by how much they can afford. Uh, and so might you uh, in terms of lending when you actually look at the, their share of the net profit in the company. Um, now, what I will say as well is it's often uh, net, shop, uh, net profit after tax. So just, just bear that in mind as well. But um, if you are sort of digging deeper, you might just find a little gem there. So what else can you do so final few tips from me would be tax calculations and tax year overviews they are absolutely essential they are the numbers that count without a shadow of a doubt um, tax year calculations and tax year overviews regardless of what your client thinks they've earned or, or maybe sometimes what the accountant might tell you they're the figures that the lenders are going on the second tip I give you, check company's house. That's a, that's a massive one. You can tell so much from company's house. Um, and, you know, sometimes you do come across clients that actually don't necessarily understand whether they're a sole trader or a limited company. And, of course, that clears that one up straight away. What it also tells you as well is whether they have any other companies in the background. So they might have got dormant companies or they might have got some passive income from another company that they're like, oh, yeah, that. Well, yeah, I don't work in that. But, yeah, I get so much from it each year. Company's house is a great one to check. Bank statements, I mean, this is really important, and I know you'll be scrutinising them anyway, but of course, if you can get them up front, that's even better, because lenders are asking for bank statements, uh, you know, on every self-employed case, and not just the personal bank statements, the business bank statements where it's relevant as well, because of course, they're looking for the current state of, of, the, of the business, you know, Accounts are fine in terms of the actual accounts of the business. They're they're all well and good, but they don't tell you what's happening right now in the business. So the the actual bank accounts are a great way uh, to see the bank statements. Are a great way to see what's happening right now and how does that look. They're also looking as well on there for any help from the government. So are they in receipt of uh, perhaps payments of universal credit or something like that? So. It's better that you get those up front, you make that assessment so there are no nasty surprises uh, to go come on down further down the line. And the last bit and probably the biggest piece of advice I would give you is just be extra vigilant. And if you follow all those things, it naturally will, will follow. But you just um, have to make sure um, that, that everything that a lender is going to ask you have ticked off. So, you know, of course, you can search uh, on Knowledge Bank on the, on the categories uh, that I showed you earlier and make sure you know what the lender's stance is. But then th to pick up the phone and have that conversation with your BDM is absolutely vital uh, so that you can be really confident that that mortgage for your self employed client has the best possible chance of going through and being accepted. Um, so I hope that's been helpful. I hope some of the information that I gave you was of use, uh, maybe if you, just for your own information uh, or something that you can use with a client as well. Um, so I'm going to hand back to Eloise now and uh, thank you for your time and uh, enjoy the rest of the day.